it's also very hard to follow two such interesting um, discussions. But let me try to pick up a couple of points from the standpoint of a neuroscientist who's been interested in the phenomena of creativity, of which inspiration is a critical part. So first, let me go to Linda's comment. So how did Linda become a famous writer? Well, she got angry with her boss. And there she was sitting on the trading desk and she got angry with her boss and she vowed that by God, she's got to do something. And then, you know, she became a writer. Now, in fact, this is, I won't say a common, but a well-trodden path for creative genius. Uh, so Matisse uh, became a painter. He was a banker, I think. But he became a painter because, or he attributed it to appendicitis. So he became ill, and when he was in the hospital, he started to paint because he couldn't do very much, and he had a long recovery period because it was a, the appendix had burst. And, um, uh, and he became obsessional about his painting very rapidly, and he never returned, returned back to his proper job and became a painter. Another interesting example, of course, of this accidental genius is uh, Fuseli, I don't know if you've, the, the, the a fantastic painter from the German Romantic period. So Fuseli, if you don't know his paintings, it's worth Googling him. The Tate has you know, some, some wonderful examples. They're, they're just incredible you know, ghost-like figures and, and alpine scenes with swirling winds. They're the most fantastic thing. It's high romanticism at its very best. Fuseli had his first great inspirational moment after eating some tainted meat and he spent a day uh, in a semi uh, stuporous condition with uh, you know absorbing meat toxins uh, spoiled meat toxins and of course I, I you know there there are kinder examples of this in as a scientist of course we're, we're all taught in chemistry I, many of you uh, who are not scientists may not appreciate the benzene ring. So most molecules used to be thought of as being put together one atom at a time, you know, a stick and a little, little ball, and they link together, and it's two molecules interacting. Well, benzene was an inspiration because what benzene was, it was six put in a circle, and uh, the key thing is what keeps them in a circle and it's, it's about all the electrons, not just spinning around a single atom, but spinning around the entire circle. That came to Kekulé, uh, the great German chemist, by falling asleep and in a semi-stuporous moment, sitting in front of his fire, he awoke with the inspiration of a dragon chasing itself around a circle in the fire. And he suddenly thought, oh, you know, I've got it. You know, this is a delocalized electron. And that became the theory of delocalized uh, uh, electrons in, in, um, uh, in repetitive double bonds, uh, as you have in the, in the benzene ring. Now, so in different ways, those all go back to, uh, to Linda's experience of, of having some sort of event. Now, I don't really believe that having appendicitis is the way to become a great painter. But, um, then to raise the provocative question, um, how can you teach creative writing? Um, now, what all of these individuals shared, but what they didn't tell you about, because they didn't think about it, are the tens of thousands of hours of graft that it took to develop the skill against which an, an, a moment of inspiration, the aha moment, could be reflected. Now for Matisse, we actually hear the appendicitis was actually the beginning of that, because there was an obsessional trigger. Um, uh, and so he, was, he spent the time, he had been a, a dabbling in painting, but that's the point that he, he realized that that's actually what he loved to do, and so he became obsessional about it. He probably was a very obsessional man in all things that he did, and he went forward. For Fuseli, he was already a well, he was a talented painter, but he just hadn't quite figured out his thing yet. 
And so he had all of the skills. And so once he had the vision, which came from this period of tainted meat, uh, hallucinations, he was able to enact them. And Kekele was, you know, had been thinking about the, the problem of benzene for a long time, and suddenly it came out. I'm sure how many of you have had the moment of inspiration in the shower? I mean, I certainly have. And, and the way you develop that is, you know, you spend a long time wrestling with the problem fruitlessly, uninspired, you, you get the tools all in place and then suddenly there's that moment in which your, your mind is, is wandering and you can make these associations. Which sort of leads on to the second interesting challenge in, um, uh, in, in the problem of, of inspiration and that is what keeps us from becoming inspired all of the time. Now, um, we all uh, I, there, there are many answers to this, but, but I think we, we'd all recognize that one of the things about the aha moment, uh, that moment of inspiration, is that it's about finding associations between ideas that weren't previously apparent. It's about recognizing a pattern that, that is or that could be that we just hadn't been aware of before. Now part of that is about dissociating ourselves from the world, um, dissociating ourselves from our current view of the world. Um, it's something terrifically important for, you know, Linda mentioned going on walks. Um, that's a really interesting sort of task because it's just cognitively demanding enough to keep you entrained. Um, but it's not so cognitively demanding that you can't do, you, you can't, your mind can't open up and reflect on something else. Now this gets back to drugs in a very interesting way because Robin used the word insight very much. Well, insight is often you know, a key component of what we call insight is about seeing ourselves in a way that we hadn't before. It's about taking another view of ourselves in order to look in, maybe perhaps seeing us in an externalized way so that we can view our, 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 our being and our minds, our mental processes um, in a different way than we started. Now, it's about taking ourselves, taking, a, you know, taking pause, unfocusing our minds and helping us to move forward. Now, how do we think, how does a neurologist think about this? Well, one of the things that we, we know um, from studies of pathology is that people with uh, syndromes that cause pathology in the frontal, that are related to pathology in the frontal lobes, in the prefrontal cortex, often are extraordinarily good at making associations that are novel uh, and often bizarre. Uh, so that's, there, there is a pathology of uncontrolled associations. Uh, that happens, you know, people with frontal lobe uh, degeneration will often have quite, bi quite bizarre things will come out if they are still able to speak or communicate because they're without inhibitory input from a sort of cognitive monitoring or executive control center that is sort of looking at what the rest of the brain is doing. But on the other hand, uh, there's also a magic moment. There are a few cases of people with frontal lobe degenerative syndromes that have been described particularly by a group um, in San Francisco where they see a lot of these people, in which there are a group of patients who seem to be at a magic point when they have enough degeneration of the frontal lobes that they can make novel associations and they don't have so much that they can't monitor in an executive fashion their ability to select amongst those associations to find ones that are attractive to carry forward to solve the problem, artistic or otherwise. And, and these people, at least for a period of time, can have been described as becoming very creative. Now that also gives a clue to two things about this, um, uh, and I'll be approaching the end of the comments, 
two things about this moment. Inspiration is, for most of us, defined in terms of a certain utility. It's an odd thing to say, but we, we, we don't necessarily recognize inspiration if it doesn't have you know, any, any outcome that is meaningful, um, uh, it, or we can't communicate it in a, in a coherent way. And that, that really gets at the core of the issue that we need to have, we need to be working, we need to have done the graft to work through a problem to have the pieces. And then the mind has to be open enough to find new sorts of associations between those ideas. But then I think the biggest mystery about inspiration is something, I mean, Linda referred to it as the unconscious. It's the monitoring of the, the field of possible solutions and this, and this selection of the one that is most appropriate to the problem at hand. And that's what comes up to the surface as the, moment, as the aha moment, the inspired moment. Now, how is this done? And this is the final point I want to touch on. This is, a, uh, I of course can't explain in any detail how it's done, but I will talk about two elements that are incredibly important. One element are, is that in order to imagine a future that isn't like this moment, we need to have a mechanism in the brain that makes us that can form associations fluidly and project them to a different time. It turns out that that mechanism is the same, or at least has major elements of the same mechanisms as that which allows us to look in our past to find out, you know, to express who we are. I'll propose to you that the ability to solve new problems is what is evolutionarily selected in large part. Memory, that definition which defines who we are and what we are, is almost an evolutionary byproduct of that. There's no great evolutionary advantage in looking back what we need to be able to do is plan looking forward, but you can't separate the two, or at least we've co-opted the mechanisms to do so. So going, how does this fit into inspiration? Inspiration has to be a novel association of ideas. It has to be managed in a way by the brain that allows it to be projected into a future space that in which it can, the, the, the quality of the solution can be assessed, and then we have to recognize that. That demands uh, both a partial suspension of our executive processes to allow us to be somewhat freer in the way in which we make connections between concepts, but it also allows us, it, it demands that we are able to bind these and project them forward in a, in a way that can be assessed qualitatively with respect uh, to um, the range of possible uh, solutions uh, to whatever the, the problem is that we're looking for. So let me probably stop there. I've, I, I hope what I've done is I've just reminded you, or at least given you my personal bias, that inspiration comes to the prepared mind. We need to have the tools in place in order to exercise um, uh, uh, the, the things that are needed to recognize inspiration. I hope I've um, given you at least a sense that inspiration is due to, uh, uh, arises with a partial suspension of the mechanisms that we normally use to monitor our behaviors, to constrain our behaviors to our sense of what the moment is. But at the same time, I hope that I've also given you the sense that, that inspiration critically relies on an ability to project a sense of the future, which um, relies heavily on the same things that allow us to look to our past and see who and what we are. Thank you.